Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Design Your Own Airplanes. For those of you who are new to the channel, these videos are dedicated to explaining and demonstrating aerospace engineering principles using simple gliders, so that you can design and build your own model airplanes that fly. In our last video, we learned how to build this simple and inexpensive glider that you can use to experiment with different airplane designs. If you have not already built one, I've put a link in the description to the build video. In our second to last video, which I've provided a link to in the description, we discussed basic glider physics and we learned that drag is a force that acts on our planes in the opposite direction that they're flying. We also learned that to maximize the distance your glider flies, you need to maximize the ratio of the lift force to the drag force. This means that to make your planes fly as far as possible, you need to minimize the drag force. In today's video, we're going to be covering three things. First, we're going to be learning where drag force comes from. Second, we're going to be exploring ways we can reduce the drag force. Third, we're going to be introducing the drag equation and learning about what factors determine the strength of the drag force acting on our planes. We'll end the video with a demonstration of how taking steps to reduce the drag force increases the distance that your planes can fly. This time, we're going to be focusing on a particular type of drag force called parasite drag. There is another type of drag force that affects airplanes, but we're going to be covering that in a later video. We'll start by considering an object, in this case a sphere, surrounded by a fluid, in this case air. Fluids always exert a force on objects immersed in them. This force is called pressure. The pressure force always acts at a right angle to the surface of the object. Some of the pressure force that the air exerts on our sphere comes from the weight of all of the air in the atmosphere above it. This is called atmospheric pressure. Now, let's consider an object that is moving through the air. In this scenario, it often helps to imagine that the object is actually holding still and the air is moving past it. We use arrows, called streamlines, to illustrate the path of the air as it flows around an object. If we return to our object, we can see that as the air flows past it, some of it is forced to change direction and flow around the object. According to Isaac Newton's first law of motion, to change the direction of the air, the object must exert a force on it. By Newton's third law of motion, the air must also exert an equal and opposite force on the object. This means that the pressure at the front of the object will be greater than atmospheric pressure, as denoted by red vectors pointing towards the surface. This will result in a net backwards force on the object. Drag force generated from pressure acting on an object is called pressure drag, or form drag. But it doesn't end there. As the air flows around the object, there is friction between the air and the surface. Friction always acts parallel to the surface of an object. This also contributes to the net backwards force. Drag force generated from friction between the air and the surface of an object is called friction drag, or skin friction. And to top it all off, form drag returns again at the back of the object. As the streamlines curve around the object, they separate from the surface. This creates a turbulent wake at the back of the object where the streamlines chaotically mix together. The turbulent wake is characterized by pressure that is significantly lower than atmospheric pressure, as denoted by blue vectors pointing away from the surface. Since the pressure at the back of the object is very low, there is significantly less force pushing it forwards, resulting in an even greater net backwards force. Together, form drag, or pressure drag, combined with skin friction, or friction drag, make up the total parasite drag force acting on an object. There is a third component of parasite drag called interference drag, but that's beyond the scope of this video. If you want to learn more about interference drag, I've posted a link in the description to a video that gives a good summary of it. Now that we understand how parasite drag force is created, let's talk about how to minimize that drag force and make our planes fly further. If we return to our sphere, the biggest factor contributing to the drag force is the turbulent wake at the back, so let's work on that first. If we change our sphere to a teardrop shape, the streamlines don't have to curve as much as they flow around it. 
This means that the streamlines stay attached to the surface for longer, resulting in a smaller wake. By making our teardrop shape even longer, we can eliminate the wake almost entirely. By getting rid of the turbulent wake, we can significantly reduce the total parasite drag. The process of changing the shape of an object to reduce the drag force is called streamlining. An object that is shaped so that there is very little drag force acting on it is said to be streamlined. This is why we tapered the leading and trailing edges of the wing during the build video. We can do the same thing to reduce the high pressure at the front of the object as well. If we make the front less blunt and more pointed, like a bullet, the air can flow around it more smoothly. Since the direction of the air is changed less abruptly, less force is required to deflect it around the object. This means that the equal and opposite pressure force of the air on the object will be significantly reduced, thus reducing the total parasite drag. Now what we have is a shape called an airfoil. If you look at an airplane's wing from the side, this is the shape that you will see. Airfoils are designed to significantly reduce pressure drag, and as we're going to see in our next video, they are also very good for producing lift force. Since there is very little pressure drag acting on an airfoil, the main source of drag is skin friction. Skin friction can be reduced by making the surface very smooth. Now we've learned where parasite drag force comes from and how to minimize the parasite drag force acting on our planes. Next, we're going to learn how to calculate the strength of the drag force acting on our planes and what factors make it stronger and weaker. The drag force is calculated using the drag equation, shown here. The strength of the drag force is equal to one half multiplied by four parameters. The first parameter in the drag equation is the density of the fluid. Objects moving through more dense fluids, such as water, experience stronger drag forces than objects moving through less dense fluids, such as air. The second parameter in the drag equation is the velocity of the object. The velocity of the object is one of the biggest factors in the strength of the drag force because it is squared in the drag equation. This means that doubling the speed of the object will make the drag force acting on it four times stronger. If you've ever ridden a bicycle, you may remember feeling the air pushing back on you harder when you ride faster. The third term in the drag equation is the area of the object. Objects with more area have more drag force acting on them. If you've ever flown a kite, you may have noticed that large kites with more area take more strength to run with and feel like they're pulling back on you harder than small kites with less area do. When calculating the strength of the drag force acting on the wing, the area is usually chosen to be the area of the wing as seen from directly above the airplane. When calculating the drag force acting on the fuselage and tail, the area used in the drag force equation is usually chosen to be the area seen when looking at the plane directly from the front. This is what's called cross-sectional area. Finally, the last parameter in the drag equation is the drag coefficient. This is a number that represents all of the math that we don't understand, and it must be measured through experiments in wind tunnels or estimated using computer simulations. The drag coefficient depends on the shape of the object and its orientation. Less streamlined objects have greater drag coefficients, whereas more streamlined objects have smaller drag coefficients. The drag coefficient is one of the most important factors that will determine how far your planes can fly. We can demonstrate the effect of the drag coefficient on the flight distance of your planes by comparing two wings. The wing with blue stripes has been streamlined by tapering the leading and trailing edges, which gives it a small drag coefficient. The wing with red stripes, however, has not been streamlined and still has blunt edges. This means that it has a greater drag coefficient. To ensure that we have a fair comparison, we're going to be using this launch ramp to make sure that each plane is launched at the ideal speed and angle for maximum flight distance. The planes are launched from the ramp by a rubber band attached to a pulley in the front. Pulling the rubber band back further makes the planes fly faster. I conducted several test flights of each configuration, during which I adjusted the center of gravity and the launch speed to find the maximum distance that each could fly.
During testing, I placed markers along the floor every five feet to see how far each plane flew. In the experiment, the maximum distance I was able to achieve with the non-streamline glider was 35 feet. My best flight with the streamline glider, however, was 45 feet, almost 30% further. This comparison shows how streamlining your planes reduces the drag coefficient and increases the distance that they can fly. However, we're not finished yet. Over the next few videos, we're going to be learning how to generate enough lift force to keep our planes airborne, and as I mentioned earlier, there is another type of drag in addition to parasite drag that we have to account for as well. Once we have all of the pieces together, we'll learn how to maximize the range and flight time of our planes. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos about how to design your own airplanes. And thanks for watching.